test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You'll hear two friends planning an event. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello, Joan. I'm glad you could come. Hello, Peter. What's up? Is something the matter? No, no. Everything's fine. It sounded urgent on the phone. Did it? It's just that I've had this idea and I wanted to see how soon we could get it off the ground. Well, don't keep me in suspense. You know they're planning to close down the local clinic. It was in the newspaper yesterday, but most people have actually known for some time. Well, I thought we should do something about it. What did you have in mind? I thought we could organise a charity event and donate the money to the clinic. I know it doesn't sound like much, but it will show the local council how we feel and that we mean business. That'll take quite a lot of organising. Why don't we just hold a protest outside the town hall? A protest would take just as much organisation as an event like this. Besides, I think fewer people would turn up. A village fair, or something like that, would attract more people and get money for the clinic. People are more generous when they're enjoying themselves. OK, then. It sounds good to me. How do we start? First, we put our heads together and come up with a list of people who'll be willing to help and people who can provide us with some of the things we need. For example, we might need a caterer to provide refreshments, a rock band for entertainment, tents and so on. Then... We do a lot of telephoning around and try to get everybody together at the same time in the same place. Sounds like a lot of work to me. But that's only the beginning. First things first, though. Let's decide now on who to get to the initial meeting and where and when to hold it. Fine. Well, the village hall would be the best place to have the meeting. It's not as big as the youth club, but it's warmer. There'll be no problem getting permission to use it, but I suppose it depends on how many people we invite. We don't want too many, otherwise the meeting will go on too long and nothing will get decided. But the village hall is a good idea. It's more official than having it in someone's living room. How many? Six or eight people to start with? Ten at the most? OK. Now we have to decide on a suitable day and time. Suitable to everybody, I mean. A Saturday or Sunday would seem to be the best choice because people aren't at work on those days. But they may not like the idea of giving up a part of their weekend for a meeting. Unless we persuade them it's for a good cause, or that it's to their advantage, and that it'll all be a lot of fun. We'll provide refreshments, of course. What if some don't want to give up their weekend? Then we'll give them an alternative. Say, one evening in the week after everybody's finished work. We'll see which is the most acceptable to them. Then book the hall. I can do the refreshments for the meeting. I'll get Darren and Maggie to help me. I'm sure they'll be more than willing. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. So, what's next on the agenda? A list of who we want at the meeting. Yes, of course. Obviously, we want someone from the clinic. I think Dr Perkins would be best. He can tell us exactly what the financial situation is there. You know, how much money it takes to keep the place running and how important it is for the community to have the clinic. The vicar, too. He can rally lots of support. And Mr Sims, our Member of Parliament. He is very busy, but I think I can persuade him to come or get his wife to persuade him to come. I see her quite a lot socially. That's great. Two other people I have in mind are Freddie Smith... The journalist? Yes. Well, he's the editor of the local paper now and might be useful. He might let us advertise for free, and he'll know how to go about getting leaflets and posters printed. That's another thing. We'll need volunteers to put leaflets through people's doors and stick up posters all over the place. We can decide that at the meeting. What about the other person? What other person? You said you had two people in mind, Freddie Smith and... Oh, yes, Mr Gates. Mr Gates. Do I know him? You must do. He owns Greatfields Farm. We need a large area to hold the fate. Right. So how many have we got then? Seven or eight? There's Dr Perkins, Mr Sims, that journalist... Freddie Smith, you mean? Yes, him. And the vicar and Mr Gates, the farmer. That's only five. There's you and me. That's seven. That will do for now. Let's start making phone calls. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 2 You will hear some students talking about an assignment. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello, Tom. Hello, Anne. What have you been doing? Oh, just sitting around, catching up with some reading. I've had a great time. You know we're doing this assignment on... what is it? Museums, their costs and benefits. <laughs> That's right. Well, I've been to the Sandgate Museum. It was really good. These local museums are really interesting because they connect people with the history of one special place. We all know about kings and emperors and battles and wars, but local museums tell us about the everyday lives of ordinary people, and that's why they are so important. I'm not so sure about that. I think they are of interest, but they're so small that they can't give a true picture. They do their best. I don't really agree. They do give a true picture, but perhaps not a full picture. It's the truth, but not the whole truth. I think the smallness is the number one problem. Because they're small and local, they attract few visitors. That's why they have so little money. And because they have little money, they can't buy or maintain many really interesting exhibits. As a result, the shop is almost as big as the museum to try to raise money by selling souvenirs, postcards, sweets and so on. 
I think they find it difficult, but not impossible. And don't forget, they get a lot of their exhibits free from local people. There was this boat, for example, that was fantastic. Really? What was that? There was a massive fishing boat, a real one, about a hundred years old, and you could walk on it and get the feeling of what fishing in those days was really like. Hmm, sounds quite good.、Hmm. But I've always found that these kinds of museums are a bit dingy. For example, the display cabinets are so dark that you can hardly see the exhibits, and the labels are sometimes difficult to read. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. So, coming back to our assignment, what we've got to decide is whether these museums should be funded by the government or just by local people. I think it depends entirely on what kind of museum it is. How do you mean? Well, take local history museums. They are small, so they won't survive without financial support. But that should come from the local authority,、hmm. since only people in that area or tourists will visit it. I agree, but what about big natural history museums? Surely they should get money from the central government. Why? Children who want to learn about nature can go out into the countryside with their school teachers.、Hmm. They could survive from donations, and they get loads of visitors anyway. The state should spend more on science museums, since not enough people are studying science these days.、Mm, I'm not so sure, but I do think a sort of museum which should not get public funds is the craft museum. Yes, like museums of cotton weaving. Yeah, which are of interest to only a very small number of people, and they should pay for it. I agree, but a working farm is a different thing again.、Mm. That's something from the past of all of us, and so it's important to the local community. Kids can learn a lot too. That's the sort of thing that the local government should be spending its money on. Yes, I agree. Well, I think we've got plenty of ideas for our assignment. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute. To check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between two students and their teacher on a planned charity event. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. So, are you making any progress with your plans for our annual charity event? I guess first things first. Have you decided what charity it will be in aid of this year? We're thinking about Help the Children Africa, sir. Well, that's Mark's idea, sir. But I myself prefer a local charity called the Meals on Wheels. I'd have to agree with Laura on this one, Mark. 
After all, we're supposed to be giving back to the local community, and although helping African children is a very worthy cause, it's a little outside our remit. That settles it, I guess. Moving on from the beneficiary question, have you made a decision on what type of event it will be? Yes, we plan on doing something a little different this year. We're calling the event Balloonathon. Basically, we're going to offer balloons for sale to all the students. Balloons? I don't see where you're going with this. Why would they want to buy a balloon? Well, here's the thing: we don't actually give them the balloon. Instead, we'll write their name on it along with the special phone number, and then we'll release all the balloons into the air. When they fall to the ground. If a person finds one and rings a special number, then both he and the student who bought the balloon will win a gift voucher. That sounds like an excellent idea, guys. Well thought out. This balloonathon has a real novelty value attached to it, don't you think? Exactly what we said, sir. The only drawback is that the gas you put into the balloons is rather expensive. How much? About twenty pounds per canister. And we'll need about ten. And how many balloons are you planning to blow up? Well, there are over a thousand students in the school, so if even one third of the students buy one, we'd need about three hundred and fifty balloons. We've decided to order five hundred so we don't run out. The good thing is we can return the canisters of gas if we don't use them, and the balloons aren't expensive, so there's no real risk of us spending a lot of money without getting a good return. You two have really thought this one out. I'm impressed. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Thank you, sir. So, how much money do you think we can raise? Well, each balloon costs about one p, and when it's filled with gas, it's going to cost us about fifty pence. We reckon that if we sell our balloons at a price of one pound fifty, and we sell all five hundred of them, we'll end up making a profit of one pound per balloon. So that's five hundred pounds in total. That's fantastic, and it gets better, sir. We've secured a sponsor for our event, who's going to give us a thousand pounds. How did you find a sponsor? The balloon company we approached about buying the balloons asked us if we'd be interested in letting them sponsor us too. What's in it for them? They're going to print their logo on every balloon. I think you've done a good deal there. Thank you, sir. So, do we have your approval to confirm our order? Absolutely. But you know, I think we can sell more balloons if we set our minds to it. So why not order double the amount, a thousand instead of five hundred? We're going to need more than ten canisters of gas then. Double the amount, presumably. Correct. Okay, let's go for it. Let's make this year's charity event our most successful. Ever. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section four. In this section, you'll hear a lecture on coral reef. First, you have some time to read questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen carefully to the lecture and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Do you fancy diving in the wonderful world of coral reefs, green sponges, colourful fish, and red crabs? It is a rich garden beneath the waves. But how much do you know about the corals? Are they animals or plants? What are the threats to coral reefs? Today, Mr. Tim Harford, Executive Director of the Coral Reef Alliance, is going to introduce the facts about coral reefs. Good afternoon, everyone. Coral reefs are one of nature's most magnificent creations. It is filled with thousands of unique and valuable plants and animals. Over one quarter of all marine species depend on healthy coral reefs. Humans also depend on coral reefs. These marine ecosystems are the primary source of food and income for millions of people, a vast repository of valuable chemical compounds and medicines, and a natural wave barrier that protect beaches and coastlines from waves and storms. Coral is actually the exoskeletons of coral polyps, made from limestone. These skeletons build up over time, forming the reef. New corals are born each April. At a certain hour on a certain night, mature corals suddenly release clouds of eggs and sperm into the sea. After the fertilized eggs take root on the sea floor, they can grow up to fifteen centimeters per year. Coral reefs are present in the waters of over one hundred countries. These are warm, eighteen to twenty-nine degrees centigrade, shallow, sunny regions, primarily between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. Only clear, warm salt water can support a coral reef, and because sunlight is crucial to the reef's survival, the water must also be shallow. The algae that grow on coral provide much of the coral's food. In deeper water, algae cannot get the sunlight they need to grow. Most coral reefs are in the tropics because natural conditions there are perfect. In their modern form. Coral reefs have thrived on Earth for over fifty million years. In recent years, however, more than eleven percent of the world's reefs have been lost, with another sixteen percent severely damaged during the El Nino event in 1998. Up to thirty-two percent of coral reefs may be destroyed by human activities in the next thirty years if we do not take action now. Corals and coral reefs are extremely sensitive. Slight changes in the reef environment may have detrimental effects on the health of entire coral colonies. These changes may be due to a variety of factors. One of the greatest threats to coral reefs is human expansion or development. As human population increases, so does the harvest of resources from the sea. Due to overfishing, reef fish populations have been greatly decreased in some areas of the world. The removal of large numbers of reef fish has caused the coral reef ecosystems to become unbalanced. As we know, corals are also very popular as decorations. A large amount of the most healthy corals are selected by commercial collectors. They sell the corals to souvenir shops, where a large number of tourists wait to purchase them as decorations or souvenirs. Coral reefs also receive much damage from both commercial and private vessels. The leakage of fuels into the water and the occurrence of spills by large tankers are extremely damaging to local corals. Although much of the coral reef's degradation is directly blamed on human impact, there are several natural disturbances which cause significant damage to coral reefs. The most recognized of these events are hurricanes or typhoons. Which bring powerful waves to the tropics. These storm waves cause large corals to break apart and scatter fragments about the reefs. Home to a diverse community of creatures, coral reefs are underwater treasure chests of color and activity. Predators and prey swim and crawl among the coral in nature's never-ending dance of life and death. This lively, fascinating world beneath the waves is just waiting to be explored. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Twenty-nine, and I find myself wondering what did happen to the last ten. 
I ran away with my life fast forward Never turn back again It's kind of funny that the more we pass time The more we need to set the rewind And I dream was the year I had to leave you But now I'm seeing all the signs Is this really happening? I can't believe it's true I'm just this surprised it's you Without you I never could have moved away But now I see what you teach I do believe